First of all, my good morning to each one of you. Why I say good morning? Because by the time I finish, it will be time for good afternoon. Dr. Demri Dean, Vice Chancellor Professor Gupta, Mr. Agrawal, faculty, parents, and last but not the least, my dear young friends, the freshers who have taken admission in law in this university. And in fact, you are the persons, my young students, my friends, for whom I am here this day. You have just taken admission in law, but if you are a little conversant with the court procedure, when a matter is heard in the High Court or Supreme Court by a bench of judges more than one, so there are two or three, then having heard the matter, one of them writes the judgment. And the other says, I agree. And the judgment becomes the judgment of the division bench. Just now, all of you and me together had the privilege of listening to very three learned discourses. Small capsules, but full of wisdom. I was listening to each one of my three predecessor speakers with rapt attention. And in fact, having listened to them, the opinion which I have formed is this, that my job of coming today here and my entire obligation which I am supposed to perform would come to an end if I simply say, I agree. <laughs> but then, I am a very disciplined person. When Dr. Dembri came to me, I asked him, how much time do you give to me to speak? He said about 45 minutes would suffice. I asked him, would the students be in a position to bear with me for 45 minutes? He said, well, our students are equally disciplined. And whether they feel enlightened or bored, they will keep silence for 45 minutes. <laughs> but friends, let me take a liberty from you all. Although Dr. Dimri has given me only 45 minutes, I'm inclined to take less time than that. But if I exceed, I will assume that I will have your permission. And therefore, I may take a few minutes more, but certainly it will be because while interacting with young students, I forget to look at the watch. Friends, let me first off tell you why I am here today. It's your first day in this university in the Faculty of Law. And in a way, you and I are the same because in this university, it is also my first day. <laughs> I never came earlier. It's my first day. So in a way, we are on the same level, same wavelength. It's your first day. It's also my first day. I can take some liberty from you. Why I readily accepted to be here this day? And I won't tell a lie with you. I had some other appointment. I requested Dr. Demri that can you keep this function on some other day? He said it's all fixed. And since our first day, it's an orientation program, I think it would be better that you find time. I shifted my other engagement, which I could, and I am here before you. <clears throat> but friends, let me tell you, first of all, why I am here this day before you. The reasons are not one, 
but many. I am, by this 1st of November, I will be touching, happily completing the age of 75 years. And today, you my young friends are standing at that point, at that place, where I also started my journey 55 years before. A long journey of 55 years, I have traded, performed, walked. By speaking to you, I may tell you that this day of yours, when you are students, these are your golden years. Today you may not realize it, but when you advance in age and more so, when you reach my age and you look in retrospect, you will remember these days. These are your golden days. So these are the days in which if I come in an education institution, I get an opportunity of sitting with young students, having an exchange of views with them, I actually relive my past, my golden years. And that thought brings me here. Incidentally, one of my learned predecessors told me, it will be interesting information for you, that there is a zero tolerance for ragging in this institution. I am very happy, very happy. I share your secret with you. The, all the law that has been laid down, laid down by the Supreme Court of India in the rugging case, it was all initiated by me. When this matter was filed in the Supreme Court and came up for admission, I was the junior most judge in the Supreme Court. And the judge with whom I was sitting was number two judge in the Supreme Court, a difference of 23 in between. The senior judge says, what is this college, the school matters? The Supreme Court is not meant for hearing all these petty matters. I said, no, sir, this is an important matter. It's a social meanness. It calls for attention of the Supreme Court, and I think we should hear it. I learned the lesson from my senior. The senior must have a regard to the voice and opinion of the junior. The minute I said, we have to hear it, my senior said, all right, you want notice to be issued in this matter? I said, yes said issue notice. And the first order which was made, laying down certain guidelines against ragging, preventing the ragging in education institutions, was laid down by me, sitting as a senior judge. By the time the matter came up for hearing, I was senior. But one more secret I want to share with you, because this is the inside story of the, what happens in the court and the courtroom. Probably you will not know it otherwise. Subsequently, after my, the matter went on for hearing for about eight, nine years, several interim orders were passed and ended in the final judgment, which was delivered by a bench after my retirement. And therein, the learned judges of the Supreme Court said that if any incident happens like this in the education institution, the matter will be reported to police. The police will register an offense, take cognizance, investigate, and subject the students to proceedings under the law of the land, the criminal law of the land. Whatever orders were passed, you are all students. You will make research also. You read the judgments also. If you trace down the history of the judgment on ragging, you will find that so long as the directions were passed by me, I have invariably maintained that police should not be permitted to enter the precincts of an education institution. To maintain the discipline in an education institution is the job of the teachers, the principal, and the management. They must enforce the discipline. Police is no one to enforce dis discipline inside the premises of an education institution in a hostel. The police should be kept at an arm's length because there are certain vices attached with the introduction or stepping in of the police. Well, that was my view, but as the judicial history would show, 
post-2005, whatever directions have been made, the element of police interference has been introduced. Somehow, I don't feel happy about it, but then the matter has gone out of my hands. I can't help it. You can't take, howsoever indisciplined a student may be, but I have a very firm opinion that you can't treat the student like a criminal. He's not a criminal. He may be a spoiled child. He may be an indisciplined student. But he, nevertheless, he's not a criminal. And if you permit the police to interfere, allow the police to let in in the college premises, you are giving an opportunity for the students to turn into criminals at the prime of their youth. And I don't agree with this concept. Well, that's all that I can share my view with you, nothing beyond. The third point that I would like to say, what I am here. I am a very rich man. You will go by the ordinary meaning of riches. Rich means money, wealth, property. I am sorry, not that. Many of you, your parents, would be far richer than what I am. But certainly, I am rich in my experiences. In the lessons which I have learned in certain principles of moral and ethics, and I feel it is my bounden duty to share my wealth with you, because I have earned my wealth from this society. And before I depart, it's my duty to share my wealth with the same society where from I have earned and to whom it ultimately belongs. I am reminded of a beautiful Urdu couplet. When you learn experience, you have to pay the price for it. Experience are not easily learned. And an Urdu poet writes beautifully well. I think some of you or most of you, it's very simple Urdu, must be knowing it. The poet writes, Mere dosto ko bhi mile mere dard ki daulat yara. Dard ki daulat, the experiences, the lessons which I have learned, the hard earned lessons, says, Mere dosto ko bhi mile mere dard ki daulat yara. मेरा अपना ही भला हो ये मुझे मंजूर नहीं। If I have something which can be beneficial to you, I am under an obligation to share with you. But then, a word of caution. It's your first day. It's cause for celebration. Celebration. You must enjoy your first day in the school in the college. But then, if there is any fault, it is of your dean. Why he invited me here? <laughs> so I must tell you that whatever I am going to tell you may not be something very pleasant, it may be something bitter. And the only thing which I can say justification. And again, I rely on an Urdu couplet which says, ki saal ha saal ki baad Saal ha saal ki talash ke baad samete hain. Saal ha saal ki talash ke baad samete hain. Aap ko chahiye to pesh karun mere daman mein chand kaate hain. Experiences are earned very hard, very hard. You have to sacrifice and then learn. This is what I have learned and this is what you are, you are going to learn. And let me share in this background a few thoughts with you. Do you, some of you have pen and pencil? No, you thought it's not a classroom. Well, if you have, please you can take some notes. These couplets will be very rich, you won't get them elsewhere. And if you come to me for collecting, you have to take an appointment. It's better, it's available free. You can take, take down, all right. Friends, you and your parents, I congratulate. Why I congratulate? The reason is your parents have chosen law as the faculty, as the discipline in which you should take education. And if taking education in law has been your choice and your parents have agreed, Again, 
you and your parents deserve to be congratulated. You will ask a question, what is so special about law? Why a student of law deserves to be specially congratulated? The reasons are again not one but many. The first thing is law, learning law is an education which is meant for highly placed intelligent and intellectuals. Legal education and legal profession. In those things you come across every day with new challenges. Your wits, your intellect is put to test almost every day. That sharpens your skills. Practice makes a man perfect. Every day you come across something which requires your utter concentration, thinking, analysis. And once it has undergone this process, then the communication, the expression. Not only you have to listen, not only you have to think, not only you have to formulate an opinion, you must also know how to express it. If you want to win a case in the court, that lawyer wins who has got the best skills, best persuasive skills of presenting his case in the court. That lawyer wins. So what happens is, even in law, when you will take research, you will find that every day you are required to do something. Law is a profession where grammar and composition matter. The mistake of a comma may result in a lot of litigation. If there is a mistake in drafting a legislation, there may be a lot of litigation on account of it. I am reminded of a limerick wherein one draftsman has said that I have been the draftsman of law throughout my life and every lawyer thanks me for the earning which he has. That is the mistaken draft in the law that gives the lawyers a lot of activity. Your one mistake in drafting a document, an important document, an important deed, may result a person in a person depriving, being deprived of his property, which otherwise belongs to him. You have to be very, very careful in drafting a document. When you file a pleading in a court of law, if you have committed a mistake, you have pleaded something which you should not have pleaded, or you have forgotten to plead something which you should have pleaded, the result will be your poor client will have to suffer. One day, I was having an exchange of views with a doctor. I said, doctor, you and I are similar. The doctor friend was surprised. He said, I am doctor, you are lawyer. How we are similar? I said, doctor, we are all similar in a way if we commit a mistake. If you commit a mistake, the person is buried six feet below the earth. And if I commit a mistake, the person is hanged six feet above the earth. <laughs> so that way, we are on the same track. Law is one where you have to always alert, always alive, always conscious. The third thing, why I respect the law as an education, as a profession is, it is the most noblest of all the profession. Mahatma Gandhi has said, search for truth is the noblest of all the professions. And a lawyer, day in and night out, day in and day out, is engaged in this activity of searching for the truth. How far he succeeds, that's a different thing. One day, again, I will let me share an anecdote with you. I've been a judge. Once I was a trial judge. Somebody complimented me. Well, judge, we admire your skills. How do you distinguish the truth from the falsehood? 
You find out what is the truth and what is false. And the person who is on the right, who is truthful, wins. I say, sorry, you have formed a wrong opinion. Every day the two litigants, represented by two lawyers, when they appear in the court of law, they dump so much of falsehood on my table that the only thing which I have to do is to determine who has told a lesser lie. <laughs> and he wins. But then ultimately, this is just an anecdote. You may call it a joke, but it's a real anecdote. The search for truth is the noblest of all the profession, and the law permits you indulging into that opportunity. A little before, when Dr. Rameshwar, when Mr. Rameshwar is speaking, he said, sometimes you see, I'm very conscious of the surroundings where I'm sitting. When I was sitting here, incidentally, it came to mind just now, I found that on one side there is Dr. Dimri, the other side is Mr. Agrawal. Two extreme ends occupied by two gentlemen. And in between who were? Dr. Gupta and myself. Now just realize, do you know their full names? Do you know? If you don't, let me tell you. Dr. Dimri is Braj Mohan, Dr. Braj Mohan Dimri. And what is Professor Agrawal? What is Mr. Agrawal? He is Rameshwar Pal Agrawal. On one side you have Braj Mohan, that is Lord Krishna, representing Lord Krishna. Other side you are Rameshwar, representing Lord Rama. In between there is Vijay. <laughs> so when you are surrounded by these two deities, the two great gods, their representatives, you are bound to win. You see, I was very much worried. How do I address the youngest students? They may cut a joke at me. They may leave in between. I was confident. If I am surrounded by these two eminent personalities, I am bound to succeed in delivering a good lecture. That's why I collected courage and stood up before you. Friends, he was saying, Mr. Ramshree was saying, that all eminent persons of the world, at least of India, all great persons, beginning from Mahatma Gandhi, Dr. Ambedkar, Motilal Nehru, Jawaharlal Nehru, Patel, Ambedkar, and Barack Obama, Abraham Lincoln, Nelson Mandela, they were all lawyers. They were all lawyers. The minute you get an entry into a school of law, one thing is certain, that the future is bright, and you are bound to be great. Not only great leaders, but if you are interested in reading biographies and autobiographies and the history of the world and the history of India, you will find that the lawyers, having taken their instructions in law, in whichever walk of life they have entered, whether they are officers, they are bureaucrats, they are government servants, they are in private service, they are in business, they are in industry, they have been successful. Why they are successful? One common golden thread, which runs throughout the success, several success stories is, their instructions and training in law. It sharpens your wits, sharpens your skills. You think with clarity, and that makes you succeed in any work of life, wherever you are. All the judges have very peaceful and happy family life. All the judges, including myself. Because we have the clarity of thinking. We know what is what is just, what is fair, what is right and what is wrong. And that arms us with enough strength to survive into even adversities. That's why I say law is a very noble profession. And now the last thing. Why law? You get a sense of fulfillment at the end of the life. At the end of the life, you have a sense of fulfillment. There are many persons who die sad death. One day everyone has to depart. Everyone has to depart. You and me, all will have to depart, leave this world. Willingly or unwillingly. But then, before bidding a goodbye, do we have a sense of fulfillment? Others may have or not, but a lawyer does have. A lawyer, a judge, a man of law 
does have a sense of fulfillment. Why? Don't take it everything because I am simply telling it. Ask a question. Why? And the reason is this. The reason is that you meet, this profession gives you an opportunity of meeting new persons every day. I was reading research, it said that a lawyer gets an opportunity of meeting at least seven new persons every day. Seven new persons, which whom he has never met. Seven new persons every day. Now if you take my case, having lived in law and justice for 55 years, 55 multiplied by 365 multiplied by 7. I am very weak at mathematics. You work out. You will find how many persons I have met in this small span of life. That gives you an opportunity to meeting several new persons every day and most of them are befriended if you serve them with honest and truth. The second thing is Every day you are rendering some service to them. As a lawyer, I've been a lawyer, let me tell you, every new case which comes to a lawyer is the story of suffering, pain, adversity, injustice, unfairness meted out by someone to him. And that's why he comes to you. You listen to him with patience. His half of the pain is gone. Then you advise him that I am going to do something for you so that injustice, whatever is done is all right, but will not be done henceforth, and whatever has been done will be remedied. Though there may be delay and dispense in the justice, but one day you will be satisfied. So every day you are rendering a service to the society as a lawyer. You are doing your best to prosecute a person or to defend a person. And a judge, you have to find out what is just, or as I told you, where the lesser, lesser falsehood. We try, every day we do it. And when we have decided a case correctly, rightly, we have done justice to the society, which is a great service to the society. It's only the law that provides you with this opportunity. If you look at it from a worldly sense, Law provides you with the best career opportunities. Best career opportunities. When I started my practice, and uh, rather when I got my admission in law, there were only evening classes. From 6 to 8, we used to go to college, the day was free. And who chose to go to law? One who could not get an admission elsewhere would get an admission in law. But today, things have changed. Today, law is most coveted of all the disciplines because once you are a lawyer, the sky is the limit for your earnings. You can earn any amount of money. I was told, if you are a good lawyer, the money will chase you and you will not have time to count what you have received. That is the limit to which a lawyer can go. This opportunity the law provides you. You can be a lawyer, you can be a judge, you can be a law officer, meaning a government advocate, attorney general, solicitor general. You can be in charge of a law office in a corporate house. Today, every multinational company and every big company has an in-house law department. You can get a job in it. And if you get a job, especially for the girls, this is very attractive because they are the working hours are limited, 10 to 5. When I started profession, it was difficult to keep an eye on the watch. I could work up to 11 or 12 in the night and get up early in the morning, say even at 3.30 or 4 a.m. to prepare the cases for the next day. But now, the modality of practice has changed. You can work for limited hours and still earn enough not only to sustain you, but also to save something for future. You can be civil, you can go for civil service, you can be a judge, a member of tribunal, you can be just an academician, you can be a research scholar, you can be a professor, you can be a lecturer, 
or a teacher in law you can also be a writer you can just go on writing books writing articles and that can keep you fully engaged friends what is the secret of enjoying the life and why i say that the lawyer has a sense of fulfillment in a way i place religion and law on one common level serving the law is serving the religion if you honestly sincerely with all the capacity at your command practice the profession of law in any sphere you are virtually a religious man a man of religion this is my feeling and this when you practice it you will learn i am very fond of dada baswani he is a great living saint i am just quoting two quotes from him the truth is there is no problem that does not have a solution what a positive message is there is no problem that does not have a solution the man with the positive attitude thinks of the solution while the man with the negative attitude only thinks of the problem when he thinks of solutions has a positive attitude when he thinks one who thinks only of the problems has a negative attitude we need people who bring solution to problems and not problems to solutions and this can be done only by man of law the invariably they are busy in finding solution to the problems but they never add problems to solutions unless by default they are a problem by themselves that's a different thing dada sadhu dada vaswani goes on to say the secret of enjoying life truly is to make serious things light and light things serious the small things the small assignments which you get in your hand you have listened to a lecture today you have given you are given a homework take it seriously don't take it lightly take it seriously but tomorrow in your career when you have a very important matter very sensitive matter in your hands don't be serious take it lightly take it lightly that's the secret that's the secret and how this principle which jp vaswani says is associated with the realm of religion and the realm of legion or the of realm of law spirituality and legal practice both i'll tell you i'll tell you there is again a beautiful couplet you can note take it if you like i don't claim any copyright on it you can take it a beautiful couplet a poet says every simple even you don't know it you can remember it have you listened to it says wo ameer ameer kya jiska dil faqir na ho wo ameer ameer kya jiska dil faqir na ho aur wo faqir faqir kya jiska dil ameer na ho this is how you have to take serious things lightly and light things seriously friends 30 minutes are over other 15 minutes permitted by dr dimri then rest will be your option i want to give you a few tips you will tell me oh, you made a very good opening i have come to share my rich wealth with you and having delivered a sermon you are just parting what is that which you wanted to share now i come to it a few tips which i give to you which i wish to give to you and these things are very important tips please take these lightly given tips very seriously what is light for me is serious for you take them seriously learn them by heart and i tell you these are the secrets of success in life generally and in legal profession especially first first develop a healthy body first requirement you will wonder what is the interrelationship between a physic good physic and the law what is the interrelationship the interrelationship is this that law is a very demanding profession very demanding profession 
you may be required to sit for six, eight, ten hours a day. Let me tell you, I am not boasting about myself, but since you are young students, I am very honestly sharing it with you. As a judge of Supreme Court, I was working 14 hours a day. 14 hours a day, including sitting in the court and preparing the cases at my residence. And when I became the CGI, I got some additional administrative responsibilities and I was forced to work 16 hours a day. Unless I had a reasonably good book, physic, I don't say that I'm a Pelvan, but unless I had a good, reasonable, reasonably good physic, I could not have withstood the strain which the work of the day brought me on my body. I'm standing before you. For 45 minutes or for such time as you will permit, I'll keep on standing before you. The message is, if I can keep standing at this age before you, at the age of 75, the message is only one. In the year 2005, I retired. In the year 2015, I'm addressing you. I have retired, but I'm not tired. I'm retired, but I'm not tired. Why? Because while practicing law, while learning the law, while practicing the law, while becoming a judge and post-retirement, I have tried to maintain a reasonably good physique. A little bit of yoga, a little bit of pranayama, a morning and evening walk. If you spare only two minutes of the 24 hours per hour, every hour two minutes, that means 48 minutes out of 24 hours you will be able to maintain a good physique. Is it too big a price to pay? Not at all. If you want to live long, if you want to lead a good life, find out two minutes per hour of the work which you do and spare only 48 minutes for on yourself, maintain a good physique. This is one. Two. You must have a spiritual bend of mind. Again, you see these tips I tell you, nobody else would give you. I am trying to give it to you and again I tell you, this is my treasure which I am sharing with you. If you want to practice law, if you want to be a successful lawyer, if you want to be a successful judge who is respected by the society, by the litigants, by the lawyers, my personal experience has been that before me, even the part, the lawyer, the litigant who has lost, has lost with a smile. He never has entertained any grievance that why this judge has decided the case against me. Why? Because I have a little bit a spiritual bent of mind. Now, what is bent of spiritual bent of mind? You have to believe in God. You may be a believer, you may not be a believer. May I ask you a question? How many of you, all the persons present in the audience, are those who believe in God? Raise your hands. Good number. Your own God. I am not defining who is God. I am not naming the God. And how many of you are there who don't believe? There are some. I am happy. I'm happy that this is a balanced house, having representatives of both. I would like to share two anecdotes with you. You must have heard the name of Newton, the great scientist. This is his real experience recorded by himself. He believed in God. And strangely, I tell you that every great scientist has been a believer, be it Newton, be it Einstein, be it Adam Smith, be it any. At least those great scientists of whom I am aware, very recently, A.P.J. Kalam, he was a believer. He, was, he read Gita every day. He was a believer. To my knowledge, every great scientist, every successful scientist has been a believer. Now why? I am sharing an anecdote from Newton with you. Isaac Newton had invited a scientist friend of his, a man who professed atheism, to dine with him. 
atheism nastik seeking to corner his friend with his own arguments newton placed a model of the solar system on his table and invited his friend to view it upon examining it newton's friend exclaimed what a marvelous craftsmanship who fashioned this exquisite model newton replied casually this model has no maker it materialized from nothing disbelief writ large on his face the friend asked what do you mean <coughs> to this newton smiling replied how can you my friend insist that this model a copy an imitation has to have a maker while vehemently denying the existence of a divine creator who made the original the model on the table of newton was a mechanical device you rotate it and all the stars the earth its seven, the, the sun its satellites they will all start revolving it it's a mechanical device he said what a marvelous piece it's difficult almost impossible to create it he said this is only a replica just think of the person who created the original so one the other anecdote is from einstein einstein again had a dialogue with someone who did not believe he entered into an argument with him einstein said are you believer he said no 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 i am a non believer all right einstein asked then please tell me who makes the things move who blows the wind who showers the rains who move who makes the earth revolve who makes the earth revolve around the sun who makes the the, the moon revolve around the earth who does it is it's nature how do you get older every day you were 5 years then became 15 now you are 50 how do you is it's all nature it's all nature he said all right are you sure he said yes he said then you say you are non believer he said yes i said sorry friend you are not right how he said einstein said first because you believe that there is no god you believe that there is no god and therefore you are a believer you believe there is no god you believe that there is no god so you are a believer one two you believe in nature of course it's all the nature which does all these things he said my dear friend there's only a little difference in naming a person what do you call nature i call god that the same thing there is someone who does everything and which is beyond our capacity to understand you co- you give the name in nature i give it the name of ram somebody calls him muhammad somebody calls him allah somebody calls him christ it's only difference of name but this someone who is much above all of us who does everything and that's why you believe in it he says yes he said then you are a believer these two great scientists i've quoted therefore you have to be a believer it helps you in developing a spiritual bent of mind i would like to in 5 minutes i'd like to read something from a book i'll tell you something about this book also and then i I'll, i'll i'll try to sum up and close this is a book which is in my hands this is dr norman vincent peels the power of positive thinking this book which is about to be torn this book has been with me for last 40 years i purchased it for 10 rupees today it is available for 195 rupees now this book says i want to read only two passages <clears throat> the book is written with deep concern for the pain difficulty and the struggle of human existence it teaches the cultivation of peace of mind not as an escape from life into protected quiescence but as a power center out of which comes driving energy for constructive personal and social living it teaches positive thinking 
not as a means to fame, riches or power, but as the practical application of faith to overcome defeat and accomplish worthwhile creative values in life. This is spiritualism. The definition of spiritualism is this. It teaches positive thinking not as a means of fame, riches or power, but spiritualism, a practical application of faith to overcome defeat and accomplish worthwhile creative values in life. If you succeed in creating values in life, you are a person having a spiritual bent of mind. If you want to disseminate, distinguish the truth from the falsehood, you must have some inner power. How do you identify what is right and what is wrong? You must have an inner power. And this inner power comes from spirituality. <coughs> the third thing which I wish to say is have a role model. Have a role model. It's your choice. You are an intelligent person, identify, but do have a role model. If you were to ask me, actually, Dr. Gupta has preempted me. Dr. Gupta or uh, Mr. Agrawal, I don't know. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Vivekananda has been my role model. Vivekananda. Is, that is Vivekananda who gave the message, the most powerful message of the world. Rise, awake, and do not stop until till you have achieved the goal. So rahe ho, jag jao. Jag gaye ho, chal padho. Aur tab tak chalte raho ki jab tak apni manzil tak na pahunch jao. This is the most powerful message given by the Vivekananda. And if you read the life and history of Vivekananda, he lived a very short span of life. But within the short span of life, he accomplished that which probably we cannot accomplish in 100 years of life. One must have that capacity which comes only by the blessings of God. Kaun kitna jiya, ye to mukaddar ki baat hai. But jiye to kya kiya, ye humare haath hai. But two days are determined, the day of birth and the day of death, that are fixed by God. We can't change it. But then, it is in our hands to do what we do, how we fill the gap between these two terminals, the day of birth and the day of death. Friends, The last two tips, and very, I'll be very short, because 45 minutes are over. I'll be very short. And 45 minutes are over, and nobody out of you has spoken that please continue. So I'll have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you just some three, four tips. Please don't talk. One, read good books. Read good books. And which are the good books? I suggest you, not one. <laughs> of course, the law teachers will teach you, you will also, you'll also learn, you learn, you read in the library, you read at home. But then, other than your textbook, if you want your vision, a width, your mind to broaden, your intellect to develop, your knowledge to multiply, then you must read something other than the textbook and start reading right now, right now. Don't wait that after having done the law, we'll read it. No, you'll never be able to read it. Unless you develop and make it a part of your routine right now. I tell you a few books which you must read. Rest you are at liberty to read. Number one, original works of law. Original works of law. Textbooks are prepared from original works of law. You will find plenty of them in your library. Visit the library, ask your teachers, they'll tell you, they'll give you a complete list, which are the original works of law, such as Taisi jurisprudence. It's an original work of law. Thereafter, many books have been written on jurisprudence, but then Taisi. Similarly, you'll find many, plenty, 
always find time to read some original works of law. Two, read some biographies and autobiographies of great lawyers and great judges if you really want to shine in the profession of law. I will quote some, give you four or five names, rest you can find out, which I have read and therefore I can share them with you. You can read M.C. Chagla's Roses in December, his autobiography. You can read Hidayatullah's My Own Boswell, the great Chief Justice of India, Justice Hidayatullah. You can read Justice Gajendra Rutkar's The Best of My Memory. All the three books are available in the market. You can read Justice H.R. Khanna's Neither Roses Nor Thorns. You will remember that great judge who refused to compromise with the government of the day. He delivered a judgment which costed him the Chief Justiceship of India. Justice H.R. Khanna would have been the Chief Justice of India, but he could not be because he delivered a judgment which did not suit the government of the day. And the day before the judgment was pronounced, they were sitting on the, on, the, on the banks of the river Ganges in Haridwar. And at about 10 p.m., he and his wife and his sister, they were sitting together. He told his wife that tomorrow I am going to pronounce a judgment which is going to cost me my chief justiceship. And suddenly the atmosphere became very serene, calm, quiet and serious. And then everybody retired to take rest. Next day, Justice Khanna reached Delhi, sat in the court and delivered the judgment, the famous, that Hibas Corpus case, ADM Jawalpur's case. And the result was, so his supersession, somebody was appointed, and then he resigned. Read a very touching narration of that day, a, a, a pictorial description of the events of that day, it touches your heart, and it emboldens you into taking a decision that come whatever it may, I will not compromise with principles, I will do only that which is just, right, and fair. Read these biographies and autobiographies. If great lawyers, M.C. Satarwad has written, My Life, Law, and Other Things, Palkiwala, Selected Writings of Palkiwala, he has written, and recently his biography has also come, written by Dr. Kamat, you can read. If you go to foreign judges and lawyers, you can read Cardozo, you can read Homer, just Homer. Homer, I tell you one thing. I want to tell you in the beginning. Why, why, why there should be an orientation? Why? And why your first stage is important? A very real life anecdote from the life of Justice Homer. Justice Homer was a highly respected judge. People knew him. One day he was going somewhere, purchased a ticket, sat in the train. And then the ticket examiner came to check the tickets. Justice Homer was the old age person, a little forgetful memory. So as soon as the ticket checker came, he started searching through his pockets. Ticket, my ticket, my ticket. But he was not able to find it. The ticket checker said, well, judge, I know you very well. I know you are a man of principles. You will never travel without a ticket. I treat it that you have a ticket. And he ticked the sheet in his hands that he has a ticket. And he checked it. The Somer said, my dear friend, I don't know who you are. I am obliged to you that you believe me, you know me, you believe me. But friends, still I have to search for the ticket. He said, why? I have already ticked your name. He said, unless I get the ticket, how do I know where I am going? <laughs> On the first day, you must know the journey on which you have embarked. What is your destination? Where do you propose to go? You must know it on day one. And your ticket must be ready today. Preserve it. Don't forget it. Let it be your guiding force, guiding speed. Friends, there are many things which I got told and shared with you. Well, we'll wait for some other opportunity. When I get this opportunity, I finish. And I finish with a small anecdote. A very touching, very inspiring anecdote which you must note and listen with attention. Last two minutes of my speech of the day. Friends, I'm thankful to you for listening to me with patience 
and I end with a parting anecdote. Everyone wants to be a winner. Everyone wants to succeed. But few know the secret which is so simple. I carry this folder in my hands always. This was gifted to me by Mr. Shiv Khaira. You must have heard his name. Yes. A great educationist, motivator of international fame. And he has, he has a message on which he has got a copyright. Nobody else can quote it, but he can. So he was kind enough to give this folder to me, and I invariably carry it in my hands. It says, winners do not do different things. They do the things in a different way. That's the secret of success. You and I do the same things, but our ways are different. If you are doing it in the right way, you are a winner. If you are doing it in the wrong way, you are a loser. So, few know the secret, which is so simple. How do we win? The motivation to succeed comes from the burning desire to achieve a purpose. A burning desire to achieve a purpose. You must have heard the name of that, uh, that Dubey uh, who was shot dead in Bihar. He exposed that uh, oil mafia and seven bullets landed into his body and died on the spot. His teacher was uh, Devashish Chatterjee. He was the director of Indian Institute of Management. Kojikot. Kojikot, yes. No, presently he is in Kojikot. At that time he was somewhere. Presently he is in Kojikot. He is retired, sir. Uh, he is retired. Okay. In the book, Break Free, he narrated this incident. This Dubey was his student. Having taken education, having become an alumni, one day he came to see his erstwhile teacher to pay his respects to his teacher. The teacher asked him, friend, I have a question to ask you. Sir, what is the question? I have never failed in answering any question of yours. What is the question? Professor Chatterjee asked him, what is the purpose of life? What is the purpose of life? Dubey was silent, could not give an answer. He touched the feet of his teacher, departed, took up the profession which was doing, took up the service, and he exposed the oil mafia in Bihar. He had to pay the price, a cold-blooded murder, he had to pay the price. And when the news reached Professor Chatterjee, he records in the book, Break Free, says, that day, I had asked him a question. What is the purpose of life? And he answered today by saying, the purpose of life is to live a life of purpose. The purpose of life is to live a life of purpose. You must know what your destination. Aim high. APJ Kalam says, aim high. To aim low is a sin, Kalam says. To aim low is a sin, always aim high. And devote yourself fully into achieving the goal which you have designed, destined for yourself. This, the motivation to succeed comes from the burning desire to achieve a purpose. This eternal truth, propounded in these golden words of Napoleon Hill, needs to be etched in our minds and hearts. Whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, it can achieve. I repeat the words of Napoleon Hill. Whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, it can achieve. A young man asked Socrates the secret of success. Socrates told the young man to meet him near the river the next morning. They met. Socrates asked the young man to walk with him into the river. When the water got up their neck, Socrates took the young man by surprise and ducked him into the water. The boy struggled to get out. But Socrates was strong and kept him there until the boy started turning blue. Socrates pulled his head out of the water and the first thing the young man did was to gasp and take a deep breath of air. Socrates asked him, What did you want the most when you were there? 
what did you want the most when you were there? Under the water, under the water. The boy replied, air. Socrates said, that is the secret of success. When you want success as badly as you wanted air, when your head was under the water, then you will get it. When you want success as badly as you wanted air, when your head was under water, then you will get it. Friends, there is no failure, except no longer trying. There is no defeat except from within. There are no insurmountable barriers. All that is needed is an urge, a strong urge, and a complete surrender to materialize your urge. Success will be yours. Friends, with these few words, I wish you good luck, prosperity, success in the education, success in your career henceforth. May you live long, be healthy, earn a lot, enjoy it, and leave this world with a sense of fulfillment. These are my good wishes to all of you, to each one of you. Thank you.